Hello, my name is Kelly Dickens. I'm one of the elders here at Walden Community Church. I'm following in uh, Jerry's footsteps here and recording a video instead of the way I was doing it before. If I thought sitting in my office by myself was weird, sitting in the classroom without you guys here is doubly weird. You'll notice that I'm wearing a hat. There are three reasons for that. First, I was really short on time. Second, it saves me from unveiling my COVID hair. And finally, I figure you're gonna watch this Sunday morning in your jammies and I kinda of wanted to fit in. Today we're continuing our study of Paul's Epistle to the Romans, Lesson 10. Does anyone remember playing Red Rover when you were a kid? It's thought to have originated in the 1800s in the UK and then spread to Australia, Canada, and eventually to the United States. Red Rover, Red Rover, let Wyatt come over. I loved playing Red Rover when I was a kid because I was pretty big for my age and I really loved busting through the line. When you remember back to those days, we always had to pick sides. You remember somebody would start over here and over here and they would pick the people until they got a team. And I always hated being picked last, whether it was football, baseball, or Red Rover. Come to think of it, I don't think I'd want to be picked last today. It's just human nature. That's what the issues between the Jews and the Gentiles in Rome remind me of. It seems like both sides wanted to feel like they were picked first, and it was causing friction in the church. And based on how much time Paul spent on that issue, it must have been a huge problem in the church. Paul addresses, addresses yet another issue between the two groups in this week's lesson. We're in the 11th chapter of Romans. Chapter can roughly be divided into two sections based on two rhetorical questions that Paul asks. The first question is in verse one, where Paul asks, has God rejected his people? If I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul answers again in verse two saying, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. There probably can't be a more perfect example of a Jew who God had not rejected than Paul. Paul will make more arguments to show that God has not rejected his people in the coming verses. In verses three through six, Paul recounts the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal from the Old Testament. If you'd like to read more about Elijah, you'll find it in 1 Kings chapter 19. Romans 11 verses three through six, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. If you recall the story, Ahab was king of Israel at the time, and he took a wife named Jezebel. Together, they turned the whole country to the worship of Baal. They also persecuted God's prophets to the point that Elijah was convinced that he alone was left among God's prophets. But God tells Elijah he was far from alone. God says there are 7,000 prophets who had not bowed a knee to Baal. Paul ties this back to Israel's plight now and points out that just as he did in 1 Kings, God has preserved a remnant. The Greek word translated remnant here literally means that which is left. The nation of Israel had rejected their Messiah and because of that, they were to be rejected as a people. But there were those select few that had embraced Jesus as their savior. Paul goes on to say that this remnant that remains was chosen by grace, not by works. Paul asked his second rhetorical question in verse 11. Did they stumble in order that they may fall? Some translations say, did they stumble so as to be beyond recovery? What is Paul asking with that rhetorical question? Stumble that they might fall or fall beyond recovery. Paul is asking whether it was the design of God that the Jews be totally irrevocably cast off, admitting that they were unbelieving, that indeed they rejected the Messiah and crucified him, is the purpose of God 
to exclude them from mercy. Again, Paul answers his own question emphatically saying, not at all or by no means in some translations. The apostle shows that the Jews were not to be cast off forever, but rather the occasion of their fall was to introduce the Gentiles to the privileges of the gospel, and then they should be restored. The verse says that, quote, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. God intended that the salvation he offered the Gentiles as a result of Israel's transgression would make Israel jealous and hopefully lead some back to salvation. Verse 15, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Israel's transgression had brought spiritual riches to the Gentiles and to the rest of the world. Their acceptance would literally result in life from death for millions, including us today. The last half of chapter 11 was addressed specifically to the Gentiles. Verse 13, now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. From reading the verses together, you can surmise that Paul desired that his own ministry with the Gentiles would be used by God as part of his purpose to make Israel jealous. At the same time, Paul did not want the Gentiles to be prideful, and he carefully explains the mystery of all of this in the following verses using an olive tree as a metaphor. Verse 16, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 16 talks about dough and first fruits being holy. The idea of first fruits comes from Numbers chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. And when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall present a contribution to the Lord. Of the first of your dough, you shall present a loaf as a contribution, like a contribution from the threshing floor. So shall you present it. Some of the first of your dough you shall give to the Lord as a contribution throughout your generations. Verse 19 talks about, quote, when you eat of the bread of the land, and then verse 20 says, quote, of the first of your dough, you shall present a loaf as a contribution. God told the Israelites to bring the first of their fruit or grain harvest to God as an offering, an expression of gratitude and acknowledgement of their dependence on God. Until this offering was made, it was not lawful to partake of the harvest. The offering of these first fruits were intended to render the whole harvest as holy. In verse 16, Paul makes the point that if, quote, the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. He goes on to bring in the tree analogy saying, quote, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. We're going to learn in the following verse that Paul is referring to Israel as the tree, an olive tree. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. In verse 17, Paul expands his tree analogy and starts talking about grafting branches from one tree to another. This is something that people at that time would have been able to easily uh, understand and comprehend because it was a common practice. The image of the tree and specifically the process of grafting branches provided Paul with the vehicle to demonstrate to the Gentiles the role of Israel in God's plan and to warn the Gentiles against arrogance with respect to the Jews. If you had a tree and there were branches that didn't bear fruit or the fruit was undesirable, you would prune that branch and graft in one that bore good fruit. He says that if some of the branches were broken off or pruned and you, the Gentiles, who call Paul's a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, you now share in the nourishing root of the tree. Paul is using two olive trees to represent the Jews and the Gentiles. The olive tree was occasionally used as a symbol for Israel, and in fact, the image appeared on many of Israel's coins. If that's true and the tree is a symbol for Israel, what do the branches that are broken uh, broke off represent? 
They would be the unbelieving Jews who'd rejected the Messiah and the gospel. It's important to note that the verse says, quote, some of the branches were broken off. That necessarily means that some remained, a remainder that not all of the branches, branches had been removed. The root of the tree, the ancient root or stock, that of Abraham and the others was good. The branches, some of the Jews in the time of the apostle had become decayed and unfruitful and were broken off. In place of the branches that had been removed, the branches of a wild olive tree had been grafted in among the natural original branches. We should note that Paul's example really departs from the common grafting practice at the time. Wild olive trees did not produce quality fruit, but the stalk, the base of a wild olive tree was hardier and could better support branches with more fruit. Because of this, generally a fruit from a cultivated olive tree was grafted into the root of a wild olive tree. That way you'd have the hardiness and strength of the wild olive tree with a better fruit from the cultivated olive branch. It was the best of both worlds. Some Bible teachers have attempted to divine some theological reason for Paul departing from the standard method of grafting. It's more likely that Paul changed the process to fit the chronology of the truth that he was illustrating. The wild olive branches representing the Gentiles had been grafted into the cultivated olive tree representing Israel, thus joining those Jews that believe in the Messiah as the people of God. As verse 17 said, the Gentiles now, quote, now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. They've become participants in all of God's blessings given to Israel. Verse 18, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Paul's primary point here was to discourage the Gentiles from boasting that they were superior to the Jews. Having experienced firsthand God's opening the door of salvation to the Gentiles, the danger exists that the Gentiles would begin to think God's actions somehow grew out of their own worth. God's grafting into the Gentiles was an act of pure grace, unmerited on the part of the Gentiles. To reinforce that message, Paul reminds them that, quote, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. The root was not the current Jewish people themselves, since both Jews and Gentiles were branches of the tree. The root referred to the patriarchs, particularly Abraham, who were the ones that received and passed on the promises of God originally given to Israel. Thinking of it this way, both believing Jews and believing Gentiles shared in the rich spiritual nourishment of the root. This nourishment for the root of this tree rooted in Abraham sustained the Gentiles, not the other way around. Verse 21, then you will say branches were brought, broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. It sounds as though some of the Gentiles were reveling in the fact that some of the Jews had been discarded. Paul could foresee Gentiles being tempted to boast and say, quote, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Paul granted the truth of that statement. Branches had been broken off, but he challenged the inference that the Gentiles might be tempted to draw from it. The branches weren't removed to make room for the Gentiles. The removal of some branches and the grafting of others had only to do with faith. The unbelieving Jews were removed because of their unbelief, just as the believing Gentiles were grafted because of their faith. Rather than a point of pride that could lead to arrogance, Paul insisted that this fact instead should cause the Gentiles to be fearful. Paul exhorted the Gentiles to think about the situation in which the Jews found themselves. They had trusted their righteousness based on the law rather than righteousness based on faith. Their lack of faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross led to them being broken off of the tree. Paul points out, quote, if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Paul is warning the Gentiles they could expect the same thing if they boasted in their own accomplishments rather than having faith in the gracious gift of Christ. Verse 22, 
Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Paul next had the Gentiles reflect on the result of God sparing some, but not others. He says, quote, Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Both are naturally part of God's character. His kindness was evident by the exclusion, inclusion of the Gentiles, but his severity was seen in his judgment of the Jews who refused to accept the Messiah. Paul refers to those that did not believe as being fallen. He probably used that word here to contrast his earlier assertion that the believing Gentiles were those who, quote, stand fast through faith. Also, he could be referring back to his rhetorical question in verse 11, quote, did they stumble in order that they may fall? The verse says, quote, God's kindness to you, referring to the Gentiles, whom these verses are addressed to. Paul makes this point obvious at the end of the verse, quote, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. In chapters 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul had reminded the Jews that God's kindness was meant to lead them to repentance, but that a hardened and unrepentant heart would inevitably lead to God's righteous judgment. Likewise, an arrogant, unrepentant attitude would lead to the Gentiles being cut off. Verses 23 and 24. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? As he's done throughout much of the letter, Paul emphasizes the equal treatment of both Jew and Gentile. Paul says, quote, even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. The they that Paul's referring to would have been the Jews. Paul is saying that just as believing Gentiles were grafted into the olive tree, so Jews who do not continue in their unbelief can be grafted back into the tree. Clearly, branches that are removed from a tree would die, and you couldn't graft a dead branch back into a tree, but what's impossible for us is possible for God. The verse says, quote, God has the power to graft them in again. Paul uses a how much more argument to solidify his point. He reminds them that if they were cut from the wild olive tree and grafted into the cultivated olive tree, how much easier would it be to graft the natural branches back into their own olive tree? Besides the obvious point, this is another reminder that there is only one tree, deeply rooted in God's plan for salvation from Abraham to Jesus, into which both believing Jews and believing Gentiles are grafted. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, who do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Paul tells the Gentiles, lest you be wise in your own sight. I'm going to make you aware of this mystery so that they don't make attempts to try to figure out on their own and become enamored with themselves or their skill and genius. Paul is stating the truth about their future and present state. As he did in verse 20, Paul reminds the Gentiles to not be conceited when it comes to the plight of the Jews. Paul uses the word, quote, mystery to refer to God's plan of salvation for the Jews and Gentiles. The Greek word translated mystery here means what is concealed, hidden, or unknown. And especially in the New Testament refers to the truths of doctrine that God had reserved to himself or had not yet communicated. This doesn't imply that anything about the doctrine is unintelligible or mystical. It's perfectly clear and plain once it's made known. It just hadn't been made known up to that point. Occurrences where a mystery is referenced can be found in Colossians, 1 Corinthians, Mark, and Ephesians. In Ephesians, the mystery relates to the inclusion of Gentiles in the body of co-heirs. Verse 6 says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. In Romans, the mystery relates directly to the salvation of Israel, specifically the, the partial hardening that had come upon Israel. 
The hardening wasn't universal as evidenced by the fact that not every branch was broken out of the cultivated olive tree. The hardening was also limited in duration. The verse says that this hardening will last, quote, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Paul uses this same fullness in relation to the Jews in Romans chapter 11, but it's a little different. The word isn't used anywhere else with respect to the Gentiles, so it's difficult to say definitively what it means. It probably refers to a time when the future spread of the gospel among the nations means that a great multitude, the abundance of nations, have been converted to God. As is stated in verses 1 and 2, Paul was convinced that God had not completely rejected his people Israel and would continue to hope for their repentance. Verses 26 and 27. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. It is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul says, quote, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. When he says in this way, he's talking about the hardening mentioned in the previous verse. What could he mean that all Israel will be saved? Some people have interpreted this to mean that every ethnic Jew will be saved. Based on some of the things that Paul has said, it's hard to believe that was his meaning. If you look at Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Paul says that their parental lineage and outward circumcision did not necessarily make someone a Jew. He says, quote, a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. Also in chapter nine, verse 27, Paul had already said that only a remnant of the sons would be saved. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as of the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So what does all Israel will be saved mean? We don't know for certain. We've talked about one interpretation. Another one is that Paul might mean there will come a time when as a people, the Jews would be recovered, when the nation would turn to God and restore the divine favor. It's not clear in this if every individual would be saved, but the body of them, the great mass of the nation would be. Nor does Paul say when this would come to pass. Whichever way we interpret this first, at least two things are clear. First. The reference to Israel as a whole, all Israel, does not necessarily refer to every individual Jew. Secondly, however God works out the inclusion of Israel, salvation will always be through faith in Christ's completed, completed work on the cross. In Romans chapter three, Paul made it abundantly clear that faith in Christ was the way for salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. In the latter part of verse 26, Paul says, quote, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Paul had used a quotation from Isaiah to reinforce his point. Isaiah 20, I'm sorry, chapter 59, verse 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. In the context of Isaiah, God was the deliverer who will come from Zion. Paul applied this verse to Jesus who will, quote, take away their sins. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. The promise of salvation echoes God's promise from a covenant written on their hearts from Jeremiah 31. Verse 28 and 29, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Paul says, quote, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Who is they that Paul's referring to? He's still talking about Israel. The people had demonstrated they were God's enemy because by and large, they rejected the gospel. That rejection had opened the doors for the Gentiles, and that's what Paul refers to when he says, for your sake. But Paul also says, as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. What election are we talking about? 
It's a reminder of the election of Israel's forefathers and of the nation to be the special people of God through God's original covenants. It's another reminder of the nourishing root based in the patriarchs like Abraham that the believing Gentiles have been grafted into. Paul ends the verse by saying, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What gifts is Paul talking about here? Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are several verses that talk about the gift, but Romans chapter 6, verse 23 clearly answers that question. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Paul says these gifts are irrevocable. Irrevocable, that's an interesting word. That's not an everyday Bible word. The Cambridge Dictionary defines irrevocable as, quote, impossible to change. Why would it be impossible to change? Because the gift... God die, or Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, it's already been given. That's, you, there's no way to undo that. He's already died for our sins so that we might be forgiven. Verse 30 and 31. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, though, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. In these verses, Paul shows how God's calling and gifts for Israel are related to the disobedience and subsequent mercy received by the receiving Gentiles. Formerly, the Gentiles had been disobedient to God and were separated from His promise. If we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. However, Israel's disobedience to God led to the Gentiles receiving mercy. And just as the disobedience of the Jews led to the mercy for the Gentiles, the Jews would receive mercy because of the mercy shown to the Gentiles. And God's grace, disobedience led to obedience and mercy led to mercy. God used the disobedience of both the Jews and the Gentiles to bring mercy to both of them, and luckily to us today. Verse 32, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that He may have mercy on all. Paul says that God has consigned us all to disobedience. The King James Version uses the word concluded. Paul used the same Greek word that's translated consigned or concluded again in his letter to the Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that by promise, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Scripture had imprisoned everything under sin, so the promise could be given on the basis of faith, where before faith, we were under the law. We've talked a lot about universalism in the past, the idea that God will have infinite mercy and save everyone eventually. Verse 32, taken out of context, is one of the verses people use to argue universalism. God imprisoned every single person so that he might show mercy to every single person. In the preceding verses, Paul had indicated how God brought mercy to both believing Gentiles and Jews. Here, Paul summarized how God used disobedience to achieve His mercy. It follows then that the all that Paul is referring to in these verses must be the believing Jews and Gentiles, not everyone on the earth. Those who were imprisoned in disobedience have found mercy in Christ. Next week, we'll move on to Lesson 11 as we are close in finishing out our study of Romans. The theme for that message is believers are to demonstrate Christ-like character, living as sacrifices in all they do. If you'd like to study ahead, the study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and verses 9 through 18. And as Jerry would say, let us pray us out of here. Father God, with... COVID, the economy, and everything else that's going on out there, 
There's so much that we could be fearful about. We ask that you help us to stay focused on you. Help us to see beauty every day, a sunset, a flower, or a child's smile. Help us to remember the tremendous blessings that you continue to bestow upon us and be thankful. And as we begin to move around, give us wisdom with the right thing to do and patience for those around us that might feel differently. Most of all, Father, bring us back together as a congregation so that we can continue our fellowship. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.